Hey everyone, Movie Boy here. So, you've come to this video to figure out how to make your movie poster just like the studios do. Well, I'm the right guy to show you, because I have worked for many years with the actual InDesign, Photoshop, and Illustrator files that come straight from the studios uh, that are used in Hollywood promotions. Obviously, I cannot show you those exact files, but I can show you the tips and techniques that are used to make your poster look just as sharp. Movie Boy! We are going to focus on what the studios call a final or payoff theatrical domestic rated one sheet. Now, although we're just focusing on one kind of poster, as everyone knows these days, there are all kinds of posters for every film, sometimes coming out a year in advance. There is your teaser posters, there is your exclusive convention posters, there are character posters, there are counter programming posters. Sometimes things are stripped down as just the logo and maybe the name of the movie and when it's coming out. And obviously your production may not have the same kind of budget that the big studios do, but it doesn't matter. All right, step one, the software. So these days, practically every production house is using the same Adobe suite. They're using Photoshop for the background art. They're using Illustrator to create the vector and usually the title treatment. And then they bring it all together in InDesign and output it usually to a PDF or online as a JPEG of some version. Some people ask, can you make the entire poster in Photoshop? The answer is yes, but it's a bit clunky. I've actually dealt with posters and ads that have come in all built in Photoshop and it works, but it's not the optimal way of doing it. Step two, dimensions. So your standard American movie poster these days is 27 inches wide and 40 inches tall at 300 dots per inch. Now that includes usually a 1 8th or sometimes a 1 4th bleed on all four sides. Now, for your live area or safety, you want to bring in the text about an inch and a half in all directions. Just because you are designing to those dimensions, keep in mind that these days, a poster is no longer just a poster. In Hollywood, your art gets turned into every shape and size. It goes on billboards, it goes on web pages, it goes on Hulu and Netflix and everywhere you can imagine. So you need to keep in mind, do not crop your elements right at the edges. It's going to be needed for other formatting. You had better believe, if you're going to build some great big city skyline in your background, uh, when they flip it horizontal, we need to see the rest of it. All right, another thing to keep in mind, gigantic sizes. So things can get pretty big with billboards. Uh, the biggest thing I've ever done is 91 feet tall. So when you bring in an element, regardless of whether it's stock or a photo or something you drew, think about it being scaled up to gigantic sizes. Now, the good news is normally those items are scaled down in uh, DPI. They're usually 150 or maybe even 72 DPI, depending on how large they are. But what this means is do not just grab some piece of art right off the web and think that's going to work for your posters. Um, even slightly larger items like bus shelters, those are 48 inches wide by 70 inches tall usually. So yeah, size matters. Now the plus side, of course, is that if you're building something in Illustrator or making vector art, that can scale up to any size and your text will be just as crisp at 91 feet as it is at 27 inches. Step three, the art. So, where does your art come from? Everywhere. Now, of course, this is not gonna be a video on all the exquisite art that comes out of Hollywood all the time and the craftsmanship that... Yeah, well, but what we can talk about is where it comes from. And these days, normally, those are photos. And of course, there are posters these days that are done with handcrafted art, uh, original works, but most often than not, they're going to come from photos. These days, the photos are typically coming from your unit or on-set still photographer. This is the smart way to do it because although large studios can afford to uh, just bring everyone back uh, months later and shoot them all over again, usually you do not have the time or the budget to be able to get all your actors back, get them in makeup, get them in costumes, if you can hunt down the costumes, do it on set. These days, the cameras that an on-set photographer has will be more than enough for most poster needs. The great news is that your characters are already there in the environment and you're sometimes even using the actual lighting setup from the DP. So your art will look just like the movie because you are on set. 
or during the production. Uh, just set up a simple studio with maybe a white backdrop and a couple of quick lights, pull the actors aside, shoot them against white and different poses, and boom, you've got a lot of your elements all set to go. Okay. I get asked this one a lot and I've dealt with it a lot. Can you use screen grabs from your actual dailies or production and use that as your poster? Once upon a time when everyone was shooting on standard definition or even high definition, the answer really is no. There aren't enough pixels in a video image to be able to be stretched to something that's as large at print resolution. It won't work. But these days, if your production is shooting on 4K or 6K cameras, then you may have enough information there to be used in your print campaign. But otherwise, you're simply gonna get much better results from uh, your on-site photographer. Oh, and another note. In case part of your uh, movie is about CG elements, um, and you're going to get uh, 3D art from your uh, special effects team or whoever is building out those elements. One thing to ask for if you are the poster designer is multi-pass renders. What this basically means is that each part of the uh, object or spaceship or environment will come to you in different plates. The shadows, the reflectivity, the color, all of that is separated out. This will help you incorporate it when you're in Photoshop into making it look like it belongs with your actors depending on how you shot them. Just something to keep in mind. And another question, RGB or CYMK? You'll want to start in RGB. Photoshop simply gives you a wider color gamut and also you have um, a lot more special effect work you can do. Uh, a lot of filters get turned off in CYMK. And of course, you're going to put out a lot of your stuff into a digital format, which will also be in RGB. But do keep in mind, especially if you're working in vivid colors, you are gonna eventually have to convert it to CYMK and print it. And now we are in step four, the actors. One of the benefits of having an on-set photographer is that if he or she are really good at their job, they're taking a lot of frames, which means you can kind of mix and match, and this happens all the time. If you really love the actor's pose, but you're not really happy with the smile, or you like the arm position better, you just mix and match from the different frames, and you have something that looks very convincing, as opposed to the extent you have to go to if you need to fake something that isn't there. All right, question. Are the actors touched up in the posters? You don't even need to ask that one, do you? Ah. <laughs> really? You couldn't hold it back in that one, could you? Nope. <laughs> there are artists whose entire job is to make the actor or actress look 100% perfect. So yeah, and those sometimes involve layers upon layers upon layers upon layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of correction. But in the world of marketing and advertising, actually this goes uh, into every possible detail, every hair strand, um, every wrinkle on the clothing, um, every hand position, it is all uh, looked at and fixed if someone feels it needs to be fixed. Also something to keep in mind if you are working with stars who have contracts involved, they have the right to kill anything at any time if it involves their image. So they get to go through all the photos uh, before you get to work on your poster and decide which ones can even be used, let alone the actual design of the poster. And um, I've, um, I've had, yeah, you know, I'm gonna stay out of it, but there have been some interesting stories. If you think you've done some complicated Photoshop work before, I have been amazed at the number of layers and tiniest corrections I have seen. I have turned them on to figure out exactly what the correction was and I, sometimes I can't even tell. Okay, now uh, for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm just going to uh, do a quick down and dirty poster uh, to kind of just uh, speed you through the process. So of course this is going to go very fast, but I'm just gonna take some stock images of uh, various countryside and uh, skies, and uh, I'm going to bring in these photos that I did of Chris Pratt um, from the Guardians of the Galaxy premiere, and I'm gonna have him be some successful lawyer that has now suddenly had to uh, um, have circumstances where he had to move out to the country, and we'll just put this thing together here. Uh, I think you guys would just laugh at if you saw how often uh, major movie posters that are spending millions of dollars are actually just using the exact same stock assets that you have access to. Um, whether it's backgrounds or skies uh, or the sparks and fire elements and all that stuff. More often than not they're just starting with the basics just like you would.
Speaking of which, sometimes this can get your Photoshop file to get really, really dense. So here's a minor tip. So besides using folders to uh, collect your files and try and make things a little uh, more organized in your layer folder, consider this. If you've got all of the elements of an actor or actress or the background completely done, consider taking all those layers and turning them into an embedded smart object. Uh, this means that, of course, that you can just double click on that layer, bring that out in its own art and tweak it if you need to. Otherwise, it's all flattened into one piece, but still editable and therefore it makes things a little more organized as you start adding more and more layers to the next part of your of your poster. Another issue to keep in mind is the grain. You're going to be mixing and matching photos that are taken with different cameras, using different techniques, and the grain is not going to match from a background element or this actor or this part. So what a lot of posters will do, fill a layer on the very top with 50% gray. Now, see, perfect. Now, uh, what you'll need to do is to convert that layer to a blending mode of overlay. Now, start filling that layer with grain using add noise or whatever you like, usually monochromatic, um, but mix and match to your own taste. You'll find that it starts kind of evening out the grain across the whole image and unifies the shot better. Finally, when you are done and you are happy and everyone above you in the production is happy, you can flatten all those layers and save a copy as your CYMK TIFF file to be brought into the final art. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of if you have specific spot colors or PMS. That'll be up to you and the vendor you're dealing with if there's a very specific color match you need to do for the logo or something else. And now we keep moving on because we have our art, but we're not done yet. Step five, title treatments, credits, and billing blocks. First, your title treatment. Usually these days, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, in my own opinion, too often, this just means choosing one of a very few select fonts, uh, depending on your genre, and making your title just big. Another thing to keep in mind when it comes to any of your vector elements is to convert your live type to outlines before you assemble the final piece. You do not want a printer or other vendor incredibly mad at you because they're stuck at 11 o'clock at night with 10,000 items to put out and you messed up on the type. Now what I've seen some people do in Illustrator is that they'll have one layer of the live type, turn that off and then keep the uh, outline type uh, active. Uh, otherwise they'll just save two different files. The same thing goes for your taglines, your quotes, your laurels. Now we come to the credits or the billing block. A lot of people always wonder when they first look at a movie poster, why do the credits look like that? Why are they so tall and narrow and... Well, that's the million dollar question. And my one word answer, contracts. The DGA, the WGA, SAG-AFTRA, PGA, and anyone else who has any clout uh, or a union behind them who has an agreement or a contract, they all have input as to how those credits come together. Who gets to be first? What is their title? Uh, who else gets to be on there? And in what order? There are some additional considerations that complicate things. Is it indoors? Is it outdoors? What size is it? Um, does it need a waiver and stuff like that? But in general terms, the usual agreements on full-size posters is that the height of an actor's name or the director's name or anyone else's name typically has to be 25% of the height of the title treatment. Now, notice I said height. There is no contractual obligation as to how wide it has to be. And this is why all of those building blocks are slammed together like this to fit everyone in and as small of a space as possible. Because trust me, if it were possible, those names would be just as big. What font is typically used in the building block? Usually it is Universe 39 Thin Ultra Condensed but there's no hard fast rule. I've seen B2 and other fonts used, but a lot of credit blocks want to look like other credit blocks, but it doesn't matter. Now, as for anywhere else that the uh, star's names are mentioned, um, this follows the same rule that there are contracts saying who gets to be first, who gets an and, who gets a with, uh, who is even allowed to be on the poster. Those kind of credits are usually done in a different font because you better believe if you're spending millions for the star, the studio wants you to be able to clearly read who is in your movie. 
And now we get to the bugs, which is just the studio speak for all the logos of all the people who have brought you this movie. Uh, also any other legal type or uh, copyrights that need to be mentioned on the very bottom. So all the logos of the studio and the distributor and is it an IMAX and real 3D and all of that. And this does bring us to a very important bug, your rating from the MPAA. Uh, the only thing uh, other than making it vector that comes to mind is that these these days you have to keep in mind that uh, it has to not only show you the rating you got, but the reasons behind that rating, uh, which you usually see at filmratings.com. Uh, that text has to be in the bug as well, at least for the full size poster. So now we have our art. We have our type and our title treatment and everything we need. Step six, bringing it all together in InDesign. We open up a new document. We make it 27 inches by 40 inches with a 1 8 inch bleed on all sides. Set your inside margins or your safety at 1.5 inches on all sides. Um, as you can see, I also prefer to work in layers, keeping the art and the vector art celibate. <laughs> celibate. <laughs> yes, because you can't have the art the type. Keeping the art and the vector elements separate. Uh, don't forget to add your registration, your crop marks, your legend, your color control strips, and always date each version because sometimes you will end up with a lot of versions of your design. At this point, it's really very simple. You just start bringing in your elements and uh, lining them up. You go back and change the art if you need to, and then just auto update in your, in your uh, InDesign. Usually what you'll notice is that maybe some of the type isn't readable on all layers. So you have to go back to your art and maybe darken the layers behind it to make it more readable. That's usually about it by now. And the final step, step seven, packaging and exporting. Hit export. Now, most vendors are gonna want you to export a PDF 2001 X1A file. And yes, it's a standard preset in InDesign, so uh, <laughs> don't worry about that. But always check with your vendor to see if they have any uh, specific specs. I would also recommend that if you need to export RGB uh, JPEGs or whatnot uh, for your digital files, to also export the JPEG straight from InDesign as opposed to opening up the PDFs in Photoshop and converting it. Um, sometimes there are issues with uh, transparency layers not quite melding, so let InDesign do the work for you. Uh, I'm not going to get into issues like total ink density and whatnot, but that is something to keep in mind with certain press uh, You can just deal with your vendors on that and more often than not for your final outputs You're going to have to set up your crop marks and your registrations and maybe even print out your slug All those options are inside the pop-up dialog here in InDesign and another thing to keep in mind is um, when you are done, you are still not done. Another thing you have to do in InDesign is to package your files. What I mean by that is that you have to go here and package it. Now, what this will do is that it will collect all of your files. It will collect the art and the vector elements and the fonts and any other information you need to put there. It'll put it all into one folder. That way you can pass this off to the people who are going to um, print out the folders for various uses and the people who are going to um, eventually archive the project. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is it. You have just made a poster that is just as good as anything that Hollywood can put out. So, what are you waiting for? Go print out a thousand of them or go put them all over your website and have fun. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Movie Boy. If you have any comments or questions or need additional info, just leave it in the uh, comments below. Oh, and before I forget, I uh, just wanted to share what threw me off my schedule a couple weeks ago. Fortunately, it was work doing things like attending the uh, Storks premiere, uh, being one of the photographers to shoot Jennifer Aniston. Uh, it was a great time, but yep, uh, I missed my deadline and I'll keep trying to do better. Remember to like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Uh, I try to put out a new video every Friday. Uh, that wraps it up. So thank you and come again.